Our next speaker is the founder of Dialectic, a Swiss-based fund focused on alternative assets. He was a very early investor in some of the best performing venture investments of the last de decade and launched Polychain Capital's private investment arm with a uniquely global, global purview and deep understanding of decentralized networks. He is the important owner of an important digital art collection, which includes People's Human One, woo -woo, and Rafiq Anadol's Machine Hallucinations MoMA through its collection, One of One. Please, let's give a warm welcome to this badass motherfucker who has been an amazing champion for digital art, Ryan Zuru! space, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> uh, so, <huh? laughs> so, as someone has, that is mostly sort of known for collecting digital art, what drew you to crypto? Um, it's funny that I'm Mostly known for collecting digital art, because like nothing else that I've done matters anymore. <laughs> well, in this oh, right. space, in, in this space, space. I, in this space. Uh, um, so, what's interesting about uh, CryptoPunks, which I admittedly came to relatively late after I was already collecting you know, works like yours and Rafiq's and, and, and others, is the authenticity, uh, that kind of crucible moment in time to create that, and how it's bloomed with a thousand flowers in its wake, and, and then the community. Um, it's a grassroots community, and that authenticity uh, and the, the dedication level of detail that, that Matt and John put into the project is what has allowed an organic community to, to pop up. And, you know, I've been in, in crypto for a long time, and, and ultimately what you're looking for is where there are authentic communities building things. So we saw with Ethereum, we saw other projects along the way, um, but it's actually relatively rare. In a sea of inauthentic communities, there's only a few that actually like care. How do you how do you tell? Because there's a lot of communities that we've saw over the last two years where it's like, bro, you didn't even know that the motherfucking strongest community, and now we've seen <laughs> that it was like, mm, yeah. No. Okay. So, how is some way, like, how do you tell the difference between bullshit communities and real communities? The, the real communities you can tell are, uh, it, like, feel really authentic in the sense that everyone is there for the intellectual curiosity of what will unfold next. Right? So, like, you know, the early Ethereum group, every, everybody was just kind of like, I remember us talking like just wanting to see the river on this story, like what you could do if you had smart contract, contracts. And you can see that also in the in, in the crypto punks community that that there's an intellectual curiosity that drives people there, and it's not there for the financial speculation as a as a, a, a primary primitive. Because crypto is you know programmable money, financial speculation ends up layering on top of everything. But the, the, the core of it, the core people driving the thing forward are there for an intellectual pursuit that you can see in the, in the nature of the conversation. And whether that was on the Discord or, or in Twitter, you can see that there is a, a, a group that generally cares about this so much so that they tie their online identity to two punks. And that's cool. That's interesting. What made you choose the punk that you ultimately ended up Getting, and how do you see this sort of like affecting people's perception of identity? Right now, you are dressed up like a virtual character. So this virtual character's identity has affected your real life identity, which to me is like crazy and so interesting. And I think, you know, how do you see that sort of like playing out in the future? So, you know, I am my punk and my punk is me. And I chose my punk in part because it shared characteristics that, that you know that I sort of subscribe to. You know, the the hoodie characteristic I thought was really interesting because hoodies have shown that community matters more than rate trade or rate trade rate. Um, you know, hoodies are not that rare of a trait, but it's very sought after and quite expensive uh, trait because 
because it's a group of really smart money and capital allocators and builders in the space, and it's become the sub community. So that's that's interesting. As a capital allocator, there's a group of them that I really respect, like Six Five Two Nine and Santiago and, and so many more. Um, uh, and then obviously, like you know, you've known me for a few years, and I think like you probably only really seen me once, but I've a, a beard, so I have to. A big beard is like mandatory for me. Um, and then, you know, always on our team often refer to to dialectic like, like a platter chip. And so uh, the, the eye patch uh, made natural sense for me. That makes sense, that makes sense. Yeah, I think hoodie culture is very interesting. I was thinking it would be interesting if they had a hoodie collection only available to hoodie owners. Don't really think, yes, no? Okay, we got a yes on that. Everybody, announce it. No announcements, no announcements. Right here first. Right here first. So, how do you see, you, you've done a lot of work with museums, obviously with Rafiq's piece at MoMA, with the, the Human One. How has that been and how do you see, um, what are some of the lessons you've learned there working with museums? And like, I, I think, to be honest, there's going to be a lot of museums that acquire crypto punks in the next, you know, yeah. decade or so here. So two things, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about some lessons broadly in, in digital art that we've had with, with your, your shows and, and Rafiq's, and then specifically in, in with respect to crypto punks. So we spent a lot of time uh, speaking and interfacing with museums, some of it's education, some of it's, um, uh, you know, exhibition, and, and it's actually been great. Museum curators are actually really th like thoughtful, smart people. Um, they're they're uh, taking a close look at the space, and many of the folks leading institutions are acquiring actively in the space right now. Uh, I'm very excited about that. I think you'll see some things in the next next few years that will really shock you. Um, one of the big lessons that we take away both from this museum context as well as as we feature and others is that scale creates awe, and one of the advantages of digital art is that you can trivially blow it up in scale and that creates the sensation of awe which people really like. And we saw that with the, the, uh, the Star of Night digital thing, we saw it with the with, with repeat thing, so we can one where it's beyond human scale and it sort of like creates the sensation of awe and on goes and museum goes. And that's interesting, right? Digital art is part of the equation that will bring museum goers back to museums after, you know, after COVID. Um, the, specifically with respect to punks, I can say I'm aware of a number of conversations of different leading global institutions that are getting serious about creating a collection. Um, I often say uh, that by 2033, so 10 years from now, it will be as necessary for a contemporary art institution to own a CryptoPunk as it is today to own a Warhol. You will not be able to have a respected contemporary art collection without having a punk in, uh, included in that. And these institutions recognize that and they're starting to get smart on punks, smart on digital art, and starting to acquire. And I think you'll see some, some interesting headlines over the next few years. Where would you like to see the punks most? Uh, next, maybe next. I mean, obviously, I think the load the moment. So I think it would be it, it'd be really interesting for a series of punks to come together and do a traveling show the, the way that we do with Human One. Like that, that would be interesting. That would be a cool thing, and like hit some hit some different institutions in a, in a traveling show, and people can have the opportunity to, to then donate on the backside of that traveling show to institutions or continue to travel with their punk and that accrues value not only to your punk because it's been in you know M plus or Oma or, or Crystal Bridges or wherever, but it accrues value to all punks. So it's something that it would be a really great community project that that I think is important around the education of how you know how foundational this moment was. And the art world really likes that. The art world loves to celebrate the first um, celebrate innovation and the punks tell that story. What are some of the, when you're sort of talking to curators and, and sort of like talking about this stuff, what is the type of 
stories that you tell in terms of the innovation to get them to see this? Because it is so ridiculously innovative. I don't think anybody would argue that in this room. It's just getting them to look at it in that same light as art. It's almost like too innovative that it's like hard to even see as art. Yeah, so the, the first thing we try to get alignment on is that the NFT, in the vast majority of cases, the NFT is not the art. The NFT is, uh, conveys digital scarcity, so that digital art is finally fun, fun collectible. It has scarcity, it has provenance, and then, you, and then from that you can collect it. You know, I find your story to be so incredibly inspiring that you were making this art for so many years and you really didn't have collectability, nobody's collecting it. And NFTs and the idea of digital scarcity gave you that, that sort of uh, keystone that you needed such that your art could have the value that, you know, that it should. And, and, and you know, thusly you take your rightful place in our Canada. Um, and so that's like the first thing that we make sure that there's alignment and understanding on. And then from there, um, you know, often curators are, are trying to chart a long arc of, of history and, and at sort of like placing this moment in time against that and like how does, you know, how does this relate to say a Andrew Pipe or, or, or Warhol's digital stuff or, or, or whatever else in a, in a long trajectory and allowing them to get excited about whatever they want to get excited about. So, you know, it doesn't have to be PFPs, it doesn't have to be Beagles, it doesn't have to be gen art or AI or driven art, but laying in this taxonomy that there are all these different categories and just because you don't like PFPs doesn't mean you should throw all digital, sure. digital art out, right? That very clearly digital art is a, a, a legitimate, category that belongs to be well represented in our Canada. Um, and it's underrepresented in our Canada today. A hundred percent, I agree. The, uh, as somebody who has a massive digital art collection and has been sort of, you know, working with the art market on, on more the traditional side as well, how do you see crypto punks sort of changing the way art is distributed, art is sold, People think about ownership. I know a lot of the questions that people have around the IP and ownership of it are not questions that people are asking about painting. When somebody buys a painting, they're just like, oh, that's a painting, you get the painting. Like, they're, they're not just like, wait, I can't make a million t shirts out of this painting. No, you can't get it. And so, I think, how do you see crypto punks sort of changing maybe that for even painting thing? I mean, you see that, or yeah? I mean, I was just talking with Matt and John about the the nature of the marketplace right? and how, from their perspective, the marketplace actually was an integral part of the art because there there wasn't a, a legitimate marketplace at that time. There was no way to exchange the pumps, and so that you know that is part of the project. The way that the community is part of the project, and uh, you know the fact that. It, it's permissionless, right? You don't need the okay of Christie's. You don't need the, you know, some like sanctioning from our Basel or, or traditional art world that, that these things can be grassroots driven. And very interestingly, all you need for a bid war is two people, right? Only two people need to say, this is important, this has value, and obviously have money to, to, go, to go to the map for something. And, and drive up that value, and, and we've seen that, that like a, a very small threshold of people have sort of, you know, either tied their own identity to this uh, online or or been excited enough about this community to confer value in this permissionless way, which is really cool. And I am cautiously optimistic that we'll see more fully self-contained, community-driven projects uh, in this way. That you know. It won't all be on OLC and these like exchanges that overly sort of financialize the products and make. So you would like to see more things, things where it does not need a marketplace at all. That's built in and that's part of the like product. Yeah, I mean, I really like when artists do their own manifold auction on their own site rather than you know 
partnering with, 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 with whatever platform it is. It feels more authentic, it allows them to connect more directly with their collectors. And that's the cool thing, right, is do not find as a living artist, you, you have a very unique position in that you know most of your collectors and you're friends with a lot of your collectors. And, and you have this direct relationship, which by and large is better than than traditional contemporary art where most collectors and most artists never meet because there's these layers of, of intermediaries in between them keeping them apart. 100%, 100%. So the question I we're asking everybody, not everybody, but we'll ask it, how do we get out of the bear market? Fix it for us right now, Mr. Ryan. Make the number go up. Make that goddamn number. So um, this is my fourth cycle, and there's a. There's this is my of, first one. Okay, so it's, 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 long, it's long, long, And that's long. the thing for for you or for anyone else here, where it is your first cycle, and, and and you're going through this pain of realizing like how much wealth you just nuked. Um, you know, I empathize with that, and and really like. Staying patient, leaning into high quality, right? That upper crust will survive, thrive, and create great value. This is true of art, it's true of crypto, it's true of venture, it's true of technology probably. And so, you know, I went on on record about a week after I bought Human One and predicted that the NFT space would break down and about 95% of the stuff would basically go away. But an upper crust of things would survive and thrive and go on to create great value. And so if you focus on that upper crust of really high quality things that you really love, that you believe in, and you can see a small threshold of other people that are passionate, fans about it as well, then that's that's the North Star and, and, and that will come back. There it is, there it is. Everybody, Ryan Zerber. He just takes the bear market for us. <laughs>